I greet you today in the name of Jesus Christ and express my sincere wish that you will be blessed in every aspect of your life. I am just so pleased and proud and happy to be with you in order to share with you a word from the Lord. Today's message is entitled, Stewardship Redefined. Stewardship Redefined. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this hour asking that your Holy Spirit will be with us. We open your word to receive tasty morsels that will help us on our journey to understand what you want from us as stewards and as laborers together with you. Bless our assembly today, bless our meeting, and crown this occasion with your divine presence so that as we hear from you, you will empower us to live and to do as you have said. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stewardship redefined. This is really a message about the Lordship of Jesus Christ in the life of the believer. I want to posit at the beginning of this message that biblically, biblically, stewardship is very often misunderstood by many people to simply refer to tithes and offerings. Whenever there is going to be a discussion in church about Stewardship, people naturally anticipate that there will be talk about money. This is a misconception. And when we have this misconception and focus on giving, it creates several problems for a believer. Uh, there is a mistrust of church leaders and systems because of our focus on money. There is also at times the diversion of tithes and offerings by members to other persons and groups because it appears in the eyes of the church that stewardship is about money. There is the problem of project giving, replacing systematic giving. We only give when there's a project, but there's not a system for our giving because the focus is on money. And ultimately, there is a resistance to stewardship in general by both pastors and church members because the misconception about stewardship is that it is about money. In other words, people get tired of hearing about stewardship when the focus is always only about giving and about money. So today we want to redefine the concept of stewardship to Put it in biblical perspective and to give a wider understanding of what stewardship really is all about. As a working definition, I would want to suggest to you today that stewardship is the lifestyle of an individual who accepts Jesus Christ as Lord. And having accepted Christ's Lordship in their life, they walk in partnership with God and they act and live as an agent to manage God's affairs upon the earth. Should I repeat that? Stewardship is properly defined for us as the lifestyle of the Christian, the lifestyle of the man or woman born again into the kingdom of God, who accepts, who willingly accepts the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And in accepting the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that Christian walks in partnership with God and acting as God's agent to manage his affairs upon the earth. Uh, stewardship principles were first established by God in the Garden of Eden. We know full well that the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 that God is the creator and possessor and therefore owner of everything in the earth. All the planets and stars, the sun, the moon, um, all the plants, all the animals, every variety, every species was created by the hand of God. And because God is creator, he is possessor 
and he is also the owner of everything. And, uh, and if you missed it at first, let me point out to you that not only is God uh, the owner of creation outside of humankind, but we must place ourselves in the equation to also understand that God is also owner of human beings. Very often when we discuss God's ownership as creator, we place that ownership squarely on animals and plants, on gold and silver and wealth, but we forget that God is owner of the human species itself. We are God's property. We are God's creation. We also, as part of the creation, belong to God. Uh, the Bible also tells us that the Lord is the giver and provider of all things. Everything that we have on earth, everything that comes into our hands belongs to God. And therefore, in the Garden of Eden, we find that the stewardship principle emanates to make God a creator, possessor, owner of everything, including our lives. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible tells us, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he male and female created he them. Verse 28 records, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. All that is in this world belongs to God. Uh, the stewardship principles that were established in the Garden of Eden are commented on by Ellen White in the book Christian Stewardship at page 65 where she says this. So the Lord God has imparted to us heaven's richest treasures in giving us Jesus Christ himself. With him, he has given us all things richly to enjoy. The productions of the earth and the bountiful harvest, the treasures of gold and silver are his gifts to us. Houses and lands, food and clothing, he has placed in the possession of men. He asks us to acknowledge him as the giver of all things. So therefore, what the church teaches as stewardship emanates from the Garden of Eden. There are two principles upon which we base the idea that stewardship for man as a manager for God are founded upon. We are told that the first principle is the ownership principle. Uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalm 24 verse 1, the sea and all that in them is, including human beings that live upon the earth. God is the owner of everything. We are only managers and trustees or uh, are stewards of God's property. And in that context, the Christian will do well to understand that God does not want uh, the things that we have in possession, he already owns those things. What God wants from us is our commitment, our allegiance. God wants us. He wants our heart. He wants our minds. He wants our gifts. He wants our abilities. Because God understands that if he can get us to be committed to him, to be loyal to him, to accept him as Lord of our lives then everything else that we have in possession will be placed at his disposal. So the ownership principle brings in sharp focus that God is owner of everything. And then there is the debtor principle. You see, after man was created in the image of God and made perfect in that image, it was not a, a, a perfection that was inherent within us. It was conditional upon our obedience and our constantly honoring and following God and remaining loyal. God placed a tree as a test in the middle of the garden. Of this tree, he said, you shall not eat. In the day that you eat, you shall surely die. But Adam and Eve, we know, they sinned, they stepped away from God, they separated themselves from the righteousness of God. And in their fallen state, they became lost. They became adrift a, a from God, adrift from salvation. And not being in the will of God, they were lost. God therefore had to initiate a plan that the Bible tells us was established from days of old, before the foundations of the world began. And in that salvation process of redeeming mankind, 
God came after us by sending Jesus Christ to be the Savior of the world. Salvation, therefore, makes us debtors to God because we could not save ourselves, we couldn't help ourselves, but because he gave his only begotten son to redeem us from the curse and penalty and power and presence of sin, we now owe God. We are indebted to God. And so we become debtors of the grace and the manifold uh, 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 mercies of God so that we owe God not only as a creative being, but we owe him as savior and redeemer of our lives. And therefore, we are called upon to live a life of Christian sacrifice. And in that lifestyle, according to Romans 12 and verse 1, we are called upon to present our bodies, present ourselves as living sacrifices unto God because it is our reasonable service or duty. A story of a little boy who had made a model boat illustrates this principle well, the two principles of stewardship. The little boy, having made the boat, was creator. He was owner. And he took it out to the river to see whether or not he can get it to float and sail. And to his surprise, the little boat was sailing on the waters of the river. But he was not paying proper attention, and soon it was swept up in the current. And it eventually got away from him and went downstream. And no matter how hard he tried to run after it on the banks and throw himself into the water, eventually it went over a, a waterfall and was lost from the sight of the young boy. He had lost his boat. He had lost his creation. That which he had made with his own hands had gotten away from him, had moved away from him and was no longer in his possession, so to speak. Well, time went on and the boy did not have the boat. But one day, as he was walking through town, he noticed in a shop of, of, of oddities that the owner of that shop had a sailboat in the show window that looked a lot like the one that he had created. The boy rushed in and spoke with the store owner and said to him, I think that's my boat. Upon closer inspection, he discovered, in fact, and indeed, that it was his creation. He had written his name on the inside, underneath some of the, the creative work. He had etched his name in the wood, and he was able to point out to the store owner that the boat he had on sale was really his. The store owner objects, objected to, to what the boy was saying and said, well, if you want it back, you're going to have to buy it. The boy went home and spoke to his parents and did odd jobs around the house and for the neighbors in their yards and eventually collected enough money, went back to, to the store owner and he said, I have enough money to buy this boat. And he bought back the boat from the store owner. But obviously, in this story, the boy is purchasing what already, really and truly belongs to him. So it was with God. When we sinned, God lost us. When we sinned, a sin separated us from God. When we sinned, we were on a path of destruction. But I thank God today through Jesus Christ that he has made a provision, that he has made a way through the blood of Christ to redeem men and women from sin and to buy us back unto himself. Doesn't the Bible tell us God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself as the little boy went home with the boat, showing his affection for the art, showing his happiness at having gotten it back. He said to the little boat, little boat, you are twice mine. I made you and now I have bought you back. You are twice mine. In that regard, what an illustration. We belong to God twice. By creation, the, 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 the principle of ownership by creation, and then by purchase, the principle of, of being a debtor to God because of his salvation in our experience. We belong to God by creation, and we belong to him by redemption. Everything we possess, everything in the spirit, everything in the physical world that comes into our hands belongs to God. First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 14 tells us everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. I will never forget when our children were younger and they didn't have income of their own. 
They would provide birthday gifts for their mother or for myself. They would give us stuff. And we, 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 we quickly realized and had to point out to the children that the very things that they were giving us to honor us, the things that they were giving us to celebrate with us, were, were, were derived from money, from funds that we ourselves have provided. So it is with God. When we bring an offering to him, when we bring tithes to him, when we give our time, our talent, or take care of our body, or provide our service, whatever we can give to God is already his. He said elsewhere, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. Uh, because the cattle on a thousand hills, they belong to me. All the gold is mine, says the Lord. All the silver is mine. Your body belongs to me. Your time is mine. Your talents are mine. Your intellect is mine. Your voice is mine. And so the songwriter, rightfully understanding the ownership of God over the human person, declares, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. My voice, my mind, whatever I am, Lord, if you can use anything, you can use me. So we continue to redefine stewardship. Stewardship, therefore, is a wider concept than money. In fact, that is not the place to begin. Stewardship starts with God. Not with objects, but with God. It recognizes him as owner of all things, life, time, resources, everything. A stewardship acknowledges God as the sustainer of life and the one who is in control of everything in creation. Stewardship, we define, accepts God as the provider of every good and perfect gift that comes down from the Father upon humanity. Stewardship, we define, uh, understands that God uh, is the initiator of relationships with humankind. Uh, what does the song where it says? His goodness is running after me. When I did not want God, God wanted me. When I did not love God, God loved me. When I was not reaching out to God, God was coming after me. So God initiates relationships with human beings. He came in the cool of the day to Adam and Eve, and while they were hiding, he cried out, Adam! Where art thou? Because God requires, needs, and performs relationship interactions with human beings. God teaches us through a redefined understanding of stewardship that Jesus Christ is our Savior. But get this. He is not only our Savior. More importantly, for the purpose of this conversation today, Jesus is our Lord. There are many people who allow Christ to be their Savior but they do not allow him to be Lord. When the believer comes to Christ and is saved from sin, Christ wants to rule. He becomes king of your life. Didn't the songwriter say, king of my life? I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. God wants to sit upon the throne of your heart. God wants your mind. God wants your body. God wants your soul. He wants not only to be your savior, he wants to be your Lord. He wants to be in charge of your life. He wants to be the ruler of every aspect of your being. That's what it means to make Christ Lord. Now when a Christian understands this, that you belong to Christ by creation, Christ by salvation, and that he is therefore creator and savior, you need to also accept that he is becoming Lord of your life. And a Lord in the life of anyone has a right to control, has a right to tell people how to live, what to do, what to eat, what to drink, where to go, what social activity is appealing enough for the Christian to participate in. God as Lord has charge over every aspect of our lives. Not I, but Christ. Be honored, loved, exalted. Not I, but Christ in every word and action. Not I, but Christ. No trace of I be found. That's when he becomes Lord of our lives, when we place him in charge of whatever we are doing. So we're redefining stewardship. And I want to suggest to you that the key to understanding today's message is to know for sure and to accept that Christ is Lord in the life of the Christian. 
if that point is accepted, then kingdom living, which is the lifestyle that is now required of a person who has made Christ their Lord, kingdom living and kingdom management therefore takes place when we allow Jesus to be Lord of our lives. He governs and controls every aspect of our life. And uh, we come to value his presence in our life, not just sometimes, but all of the time. 24-7, God is in control. That being so, church, hear me now. This means that in order for Jesus to be Lord of your life, he needs to be ruler, boss, and the master of every aspect of your life. He cannot be Lord of a part of your life. He must be Lord of everything. We cannot have compartments for the world, for the devil, for ourselves. We must give it all to Jesus. All of it must be surrendered. All to him must be freely given. We will have a love and trust him in his presence daily live. The songwriter says, as Lord, we must surrender all. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 explains to us that every dimension of human life and existence must be submitted to God. And subjugated to his lordship. According to the apostle Paul. Now may the God of peace himself. Sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit. Your whole soul. And your whole body. Be preserved blameless. At the coming of the Lord. Jesus Christ. So God is lord of your spirit. That spiritual, emotional part of your being. God is Lord of your soul, that, that life force that, 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 that also includes your talents, your abilities, your mental capacity. God is also Lord of your body. And whatsoever you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. And when we understand the larger picture of Lordship, stewardship can never again be defined simply by money by tithes and in offerings, because it is a whole life experience that now becomes submitted to God because he is Lord. But let me add some details to this so you can, can get what I'm saying to you. In Mark chapter 12, verse 28 and 30, a passage that was first exposed and explained by God in the book of Deuteronomy is repeated. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord. Notice the word Lord. The Lord your God. With all your heart. Notice the word all. We are called upon to love God with all. With all. Not a trace of I be found. Not a trace of I be found. Only in Christ. Love him with all your heart. And with all your soul. And with all your mind. And with all your strength. This is what the Bible says the Christian's experience is supposed to be like. Now the word all is the Greek word holos. From which we get our English derivative holistic. H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C. It means the entire or complete thing. The whole thing. There can be no holding back. There can be no reservations. There can be no incompleteness or doubt in our devotion and commitment to God. We are either all for Jesus or we are all for the devil. Didn't Jesus himself say, He that does not gather with me scattereth abroad. You cannot serve God and mammon. And so when the believer accepts Jesus Christ and makes him Lord, he serves God with everything he has. He serves him with his house and he serves him with his car and he serves him with his animals and he serves him with his children and he serves him with his money and he serves him with his tithes and he serves him with his offerings and he serves him with his crops and he serves him with his attitudes and he serves him with his job and he serves him 
in every department and aspect of his life because God commands us, love me with all. We cannot therefore reserve our clothing for ourselves, but our hearts be to God. It is inconsistent to say we have a heart for God that does not affect the way we dress, affect the way we eat, affect where we go, affect what entertainment we get involved in. Because if the heart is given to God, the body is also given to God, the mind is also given to God, the strength is also given to God. Every aspect of our body is controlled by God. In a sense, therefore, the Christian no longer has a secular life and a religious life. All of the Christian's life is religious, controlled by God. And we don't have off seasons or off times where now we are focused on God and at other times we are not focused on God. We do not drop our guard. We do not show up in seasons to worship God and then fall away from that. If God is for us, we need to understand, we need to give him all. All. There can be no holding back. Many years ago, I read a human story of a knight, a brave knight, who met a woman. She was so lovely and beautiful. And he immediately, in the context of our story, love at first sight, fell in love with her. And he said to her, you are the fairest of the fair. You are the loveliest of the lovely. You are the most beautiful of the beautiful. I would like to marry you. And she said, Knight, you come on in here pledging your love to me, saying I'm the fairest of the fair, the most lovely of the lovely, the most beautiful of the beautiful. But wait a while before you commit. You have not seen my sister yet. He asked for directions and he gets on his horse and he rides off to try and to meet this sister. When he gets there, he takes one look at her. He jumps back on the horse, rides back to the first sister and said, I've seen your sister, but I do confess my love for you. And I'm saying to you, you are not your sister. You are the loveliest of the lovely. You are the fairest of the fair. You are the most beautiful of the beautiful. And the woman looked at the knight and said, knight, you come in here uh, with all of these platitudes and nice sounding words saying I'm the most lovely of the lovely, the fairest of the fair, the most beautiful of the beautiful, but you shall not have me because at my first suggestion, you ran off to look at another woman. You had second thoughts. You were considering the possibility of something else. With God, it's all or nothing. I surrender all. There is no other God but Jehovah. If God be God, then serve him. If Baal be God, then serve him. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. A single mind, a single heart, a commitment that does not waver is what God requires. He does not want part of me. He wants all of me. And that's the basis of understanding stewardship. Because when we belong to God, it means everything else we bring with us belongs to God. We are redefining our understanding of stewardship. Love God with all your heart. Heart is the inner person and that which is the center of our life. It means desiring God above all else. It is passion. Love God with all soul. Soul is the physical life. To love God with all our soul, or life means to be willing to give one's life to God and to devote all of our life to him. Not some part of our behavior. All of our behavior is controlled by God. And then to love God with the mind. The mind is where we have ideas and viewpoints and perspectives of life. And this means that our thinking be not conformed to the world, but be renewed by the transformation of your mind. We must think God and, and have a viewpoint of God and a perspective of life of God. That is motivated by the fact that he is Lord in our lives. To love God with all our mind means to submit our minds, our thought patterns, our opinions and decisions to God's word. And what this means is that we will keep out of our minds those things that will corrupt the mind. The sound mind is required in order to serve God. And then love God with all your strength. This means all our physical abilities, all our talents, all our gifts, all our physical powers, all of these are to be surrendered and devoted to him for his glory. Philippians chapter 2 verse 90, 11 makes it plain. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted Christ and have given him a name which is above 
every other name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue, says the apostle Paul, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And I just love how the songwriter puts it. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem. Crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom of the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him. Lord of all, let every king dread, every tribe on this terrestrial ball, to him all majesty ascribes and crown him, crown him, crown him Lord of all. If we should do this, we will have no room in our own hearts for selfishness and the issues related to money, to body, the time, the talents will be taken care of because he is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives affects our worship, affects our leadership, affects our relationships, affects our possessions, affects our finances, affects our language, the way in which we speak. So holistically, this is what stewardship is all about. It's management under God's lordship, management under God's control. It's every facet of our life. So I ask you today, what do you value? Where are your values? Who is Lord of your life? Uh, uh, do you value the secular or the spiritual? Because Jesus resides in the spiritual and not the secular. Do you value the temporal or the eternal? That which will pass away and that which is forever. Do you value, uh, are you self-centered or are you Christ-centered? Hear me now to the church of God. Um, are you focused on the body or are you focused on the spirit? Are you focused on the short term or are you focused on the long term? Or are you focused on self-control or are are you focused on spirit control? Where are you focused today? I want to explain to you quickly that there are two levels of human life. Uh, on the top rung, we understand that uh, this is what we, we see openly. We look at people and we see behaviors. Didn't God tells Samuel, don't look on the outside because God really looks at the heart. Didn't God say to Samuel, don't be deceived by David's bigger brothers, how majestic and kingly they appeared because God does not look how men look. Men look at the outward appearance, but God look at the heart. And unfortunately, we cannot see more than that sometimes. We can just see how people behave, how they express themselves, uh, um, th their views and values, and the products and activities they participate in. That's the external, the outside level. But then there's a deeper level. A level where in people's minds there is a, a philosophy, a worldview that, that drives them. They have core beliefs and core values and principles, things that guide their perspective, that guide their life. The deeper level is inside, but the external level is the, the shallow level. It's the surface level. I, I want to tell you that, that the deeper level is not seen by human eyes, but it is out of the issues of a man's heart 
than his mouth speaks. Didn't Jesus say that? And so we understand that what's on the inside is expressed on the outside. And we come to understand that's what people see. That's what people judge. And if you practice things long enough on the outside, you internalize them and they reinform your values on the inside. What you practice, you become. What you do, you perfect. And therefore, out of our abundance of values and core beliefs, outsprings for people to see who we truly, truly are on the inside. But if we practice sin long enough, if we steal long enough and lie long enough, we become comfortable with that and it feeds back into our internal and is reinforced because we are practicing evil. So we strengthen our core values in evil. No, I, I, I want to, I'm excited about this. I just want to show you something else about this. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. Our values and our principles give rise to our expressive behavior on the outside. Who we are on the inside is betrayed by what we are on the outside. Again, church, examining the surface level and the deeper level, we understand this, that the, the deeper level, uh, uh, if it is about self, I and me, and if that's the values on which your life is hung, it shows in your behavior. So you don't give God time. You don't give God your body. You don't give God your finance. You don't give God your children. You don't give God your worship. You don't give God your influence. You don't give anything to God because your internal locus of control, your core belief system and values and principles are about self. And if you feed that monster, it grows and recoils back inside of you. You become greedy, you become envious, you become jealous, and these are the things that then become your core values. But I thank God that even though we are trapped in sin and overcome by our natures, that the cross of Jesus makes the difference in the believer's life. When Christ comes in, there's value transformation. Galatians 2 verse 20 tells us, I have been crucified with Christ. <laughs> when we come face to face with the cross of Jesus Christ, value transformation occurs. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, says the Apostle Paul, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Oh, wretched man that I am, Romans chapter 5, verse 24 and 25, who shall rescue me from this body of death? I thank God that Jesus Christ will be my deliverer. And therefore, a life with Jesus. <laughs> Children used to sing, a life without Jesus is like a donut. donut. Sorry. There's a hole in the center of your heart. But a life with Jesus is a life that helps you to bring out the core values and the value principles from the deeper level. You understand that when Christ is in your heart, when Christ is in your mind, when Christ is the basis of your core values, when Christ is the basis of your principles, when Christ is Lord of your life, it shows on the outside and your behaviors become faithfulness and sacrifice. And that is what we call stewardship. And if we practice faithfulness and sacrifice, it feeds back into us and becomes part of us so that our natures are built up by God. And therefore, we do honor to the Lord of our lives. So today, there are competing values. Uh, there's a value of self versus the value of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a value of self-serving, self-indulgence, self-gratification, self-seeking, self-centeredness, as opposed when we meet Jesus Christ, self-serving becomes service. Self-indulgence becomes simplicity. Self-gratification becomes sacrifice. Self-seeking becomes surrender. Self-centeredness becomes submission. And the link of relationships that makes the difference is that Jesus Christ is the center of it all. 
So if we get the right information from the Bible, from the spirit of prophecy, from the preacher, from the lecturer, we will not get the right behavior unless we have the right relationship. And that relationship is the missing piece. When we have a relationship with Christ, nobody will have to tell us about giving anything. It will happen. We'll give our time. We'll give our bodies. We will give our children. We will give our finances. We will give our influence. Jesus is the link that will bring all of this to fruition. So kingdom management, therefore, as I said before, takes place when we allow Jesus to be Lord, the governing and controlling force and value in our lives. I'm on my final approach. Generally, therefore, as I summarize, our entire service to God is a matter of stewardship. It involves spiritual talents, our bodies, all material things, our time. We can be sure of the gospel. We must do evangelism and preach and call men out of darkness. We are sure of the souls of people in the local church, pastors and elders and others. We have to take care of people. That is stewardship. We are sure of our children. We must bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord and direct them towards Christian education. And finally, something that may surprise you, I want to spend a little time with this before I'm done. We are sure of death. What a strange thing for Pastor Hall to say. Isaiah 38 verse 1 tells us that God declares by sending the prophet Isaiah to Hezekiah. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You are not going to live. And the white therefore commenting on this tells us that there's a stewardship of death. That we must also bear in mind that many are not exercised. He says in Adventist home page 396 upon the subject of making their wills while they are in apparent good health. But this precaution should be taken by our brethren. They should know their financial standing and should not allow their business to become entangled. They should arrange their property in such a manner that they may leave it at any time. Our stewardship does not end. When we die, we have a responsibility to give back to God whatever he has given to us. Ellen also says, Adventist on page 397, in disposing of your property by will to your relatives, be sure that you do not forget God's cause. You are his agents holding his property and his claims should have your first consideration. Your wife and children, of course, should not be left destitute. Provisions should be made for them if they are needy. But do not. Do not simply because it is customary bring into your will a long line of relatives who are not needed. It's a stewardship in death. Set your house in order. I end then by telling you that Jesus' management as Lord of all lives is a process. Step one, we accept eternal life as God's gift. Step two, we make Jesus the number one in our life. That is, he becomes Lord. Step three, we allow God's spirit to lead us daily. Step four, we stay connected to God in prayer, Bible study, and the exercising of our spiritual powers. Step five, we make time to study the Bible. Step six, we provide service to other people in need. And step seven, we share what Jesus has done for us and what Jesus has given to us with others for the building up of his kingdom. I want to ask you today as I appeal to you, what does the Lordship of Jesus Christ mean for you as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? I pray and hope and trust that it means that you have given Christ your all. And in giving him your all, your everything, stewardship becomes merely subjugating all that you are and all that you have to be used by God. And that is how we redefine 
stewardship. May God bless you as we endeavor to give our entire lives to Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take our feet, let them move. Take our lips, let them speak. At the impulse of thy love, all to Jesus we surrender. Amen.